Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today we're going to talk about evil. In particular, uh, I want to talk about a philosophical text, and I want to talk about Star Wars. Two topics that I think are related quite a bit already, but could always be related to time. Uh, in particular, the philosophical text I want to talk about is Anselm's On the Fall of the Devil from his three philosophical dialogues. Here. Um, and the concept I want to talk about in Star Wars is closely related to Anselm's points in De Casu Diaboli, or The Fallen Devil, referring to the translation interchangeably. Um, and that is the idea of Force ghosts and the sort of afterlife of the Force. In particular, I want to look at the potential afterlife, or the lack of potential, for Darksiders, or Sith, to become Force ghosts. Uh, and how this relates to uh, to how Anselm describes the fall of Satan, and how was it that Satan's choices and his moral and immoral decisions led to the fall and led to his eternal damnation. So I'll begin uh, by analyzing Anselm, and then we'll relate it on to Force Ghosts. So Anselm's De Casu Diaboli, the, on the fall of the devil, has a few main purposes. Uh, primarily to explain the sort of mechanics of free choice. Uh, it follows the dialogue on free choice, which does a lot more of this in the human context. But he looks to the angels to look at specifically how choice works in the abstract, abstracting it away from the particularities of human choices. We have trouble deciding things. Decisions for human beings are uh, are very, very complicated because they come with a lot of concomitant factors. Uh, things like uh, our bodies, right? our desires, our needs change from moment to moment. We're easily distracted by things. We are tempted by things. And so all of these provide complications to the way we make decisions. This is in contrast to angels. Angels are incorporeal. They are pure spirit, pure mind. They only make pure choices, choices which are between absolute abstracts, which are not uh, which are not altered by the particularities of corporeality, of the body, of the physical world, of the changes in the world around them. And so this is why, on the, the scholastic view more broadly, this is why the angel's initial primal choice is seen as settled. Right? The glorified angels, the angels who choose to obey God, choose to obey God for all eternity. And the fallen angels sin and disobey God and turn away from God for all eternity. There is one primal choice which settles the angels' destiny. And this is why we human beings can change throughout our lives. This is in stark contrast. And so throughout De Casa Diaboli, Anselm sets up uh, a hypothetical or a possible scenario of how God presented this choice to the angels at the beginning of their creation. He sets it up something like this. God provides to all of the angels, both those who would fall and those who would obey, he provides with them everything they could possibly want, except one thing. Now, Anselm is unspecific as to what that is, at least initially, um, and what it is doesn't particularly matter uh, for purposes of the choice. The point, though, is that it presents the angels with a stark dichotomy. If the angels are given almost everything they could possibly desire for their own advantage, every bit of power and glory and majesty, uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom, and everything they could want except for one additional little thing, and then God tells the angels to not desire, to not seek that additional thing. Now, they could try. They could, they could uh, choose to pursue this additional thing. This choice between two alternatives means that the choice is strictly between obedience to God and disobedience to God for the sake of one's own advantage. Um, Anselm outlines this distinction as, the, uh, as having two wills uh, or two objects of willing, uh, one being justice or the good, the other being advantage for the self. So, the good angels 
choose to forgo this additional good in their obedience to God uh, and their desire for the good. So that means what they're doing is they are rejecting this additional bit of advantage that would benefit them. It would make them individually better off, but at the expense of their relationship with God. By contrast, the angels who would then fall decide to reject God's command, turn away from what he has already given them, and to seek this additional something. All right, here's the setup. This is the choice. Good angels choose to obey and choose to forsake this additional good. The fallen angels, or the ones who will then fall as a result, choose to disobey God and pursue selfish advantage. They want what is best for them and them alone at the expense of what is good overall, the common good, the greater good, the good uh, in general, the unconditioned good. God, essentially. And so now the results of this choice uh, are, are what cause the results. Or the results of the choice are what cause the eternal results, I guess I should say. Uh, and are what cause the good angels to remain steadfast in their goodness eternally, and the fallen angels to uh, to remain utterly fallen and depraved for all eternity as well. So for this, I want to read um, uh, a fairly long passage, so bear with me. Anselm says, And so the good angels willed the justice that they had rather than that additional something which they didn't have, as far as their own will was concerned, they lost that good, as it were, for the sake of justice, but they received it as a reward for justice. They remained forever in secure possession of what they had. What this means is essentially they forsook, they, they abandoned this additional good. They willed against it. They willed to abandon it in favor of justice. But then God gives this additional something to them as a reward for their just choice, for their obedience. He continues. Hence, they have progressed so far that they have attained everything they could will. They no longer see what more they could will. Because of this, they are unable to sin. What this means is they have everything they could possibly want to acquire for their own benefit. And so anything they could desire could only be for the sake of justice. Even retaining, even willing to retain the goods that they have for themselves, that will is now aligned with God's will. It is aligned with justice. It is an upright act of willing, as you would say, as Anselm would say. So any choice the good angels could possibly make is a good choice, because it's the only thing they have to will, because they have everything. There's nothing that they're lacking. There's nothing that they could be grasping for. They could be acquisitive for. They could be greedy for, in that sense. We want to take the language of deadly sin. And some continues. By contrast, the evil angels willed that additional something which God did not yet will to give them, rather than willing to remain steadfast in the justice in which they were created. By the judgment of that very justice, they not only failed utterly to obtain that on account of which they scorned justice, but also lost the good they had. What this means is by, by turning away from what God had already given them, and by instead choosing to pursue this something extra, this additional something, they abandon all that they had, which was everything that they had, everything that they were good that they possess. They abandon it in favor of pursuing this additional something, which of course, being finite creatures still, glorified angels regardless, still finite. They are not God. They're unable to obtain this additional something by their own accord. And some continues. Therefore, the angels are distinguished in the following way. Those who cleave to justice and will no good that they do not already enjoy, and those who abandon justice can will no good that they do not lack. So what this means here is that because these fallen angels lost everything that they had and they did not acquire this additional something, any will that they could have 
can only be the will for advantage because they simply lack everything. Everything that they could want for their own selfish benefit, they do not have. So they could only desire to acquire it. Even willing to obey God under these circumstances could only amount to the will for selfish advantage because it would be the will to reobtain all that they lost. So any will, any desire, any choice the devil and the fallen angels could possibly make is in disobedience to God because of this primal choice, because of this primal choice that set them, set their souls into such a state as this. So the student in the dialogue responds, nothing could be more just or more beautiful than this distinction. Absolutely couldn't agree more. This is essentially how God tricks Satan into voluntarily and spontaneously damning himself for all eternity. Again, entirely through his own free choice. This isn't God deciding to damn Satan. This isn't God even directly punishing Satan for his sin, for his pride, for his greed, for his vanity, all of these things. It is simply a natural consequence of the kind of acquisitiveness that led to the fall in the first place. Or at least the kind of acquisitiveness that led to the fall of Satan. Now, we can apply this elsewhere as well. We can, apply, we can apply this kind of reasoning to the results of our own personal sin. We can apply this kind of reasoning to the results of the fall of man, so the fall of Adam. Parallels are apparent. But as I indicated earlier, I would like to apply this reasoning instead to the topic of Force ghosts in Star Wars. So, the Jedi those who follow the light side of the Force. Their goal, is, their goal, their single striving goal, is to become one with the Force, to obey the will of the Force, represented as, a, as more pantheistic than, than theistic. Um, however, it is still uh, comparatively close to something like we would expect from sort of classical theism, where the will of the Force is harmony, unity, the good, beneficence, charity, all of these, all these good things which we, we rightly associate with virtue under a theistic framework. Particularly uh, aspects that we would, we would directly associate with the divine in some cases. That's perhaps a topic for another talk. In this case, though, what we see is the, the Gemini, those who follow the light side, Abandon all selfishness for the sake of the good. Whether that's harmony, whether that's oneness, whether that is um, obeying the will of the Force. And as we see in, uh, in a few um, maybe more obscure sources, uh, particularly in a, um, uh, the sequence from, uh, from the Clone Wars where Yoda first learns how, uh, how it is that, we, that Jedi can become Force Ghosts. Link a version of that. We see that this is only possible by letting go of one's selfish desires. And instead, uh, so willing to abandon the self for the sake of the good, for the sake of all that is the Force. But so by doing... By, by doing this, by abandoning one's own selfish desires, one's particularly one's desire for immortality, which is a grasping onto life and grasping onto oneself and what makes one uh, self, in man's own terms, personal advantage. But by letting go of all this, by willing to abandon these things that would make ourselves personally better off, the Jedi gain immortality personal immortality through the Force. We have, by contrast, the Sith, those who follow the dark side of the Force, were defined by their acquisitiveness, their passion, their turning inward onto oneself. Their focus is for personal advantage, whether that is displayed as power, whether that's displayed as pleasure, whether that is displayed uh, as the, this desire for immortality 
that we see with the tragedy of Dark Darth Plagueis the Wise. It's ironic. He could save others from death, but not himself. But because of that acquisitiveness, by attempting so desperately to hold on to themselves, to grasp at what they cannot achieve of their power, in their quest even for immortality itself, this acquisitiveness, this selfishness, is precisely what prevents Darksiders from achieving the same kind of immortality that Jedi can. And so this is why we see Darksiders never being able to become Force Ghosts in the proper sense. The most they can do is the kind of immortality that we might have as corporeal, purely corporeal beings. Maybe aided with a little bit of what I call magic. But the closest you see to immortality uh, for the Sith are echoes of their power. You see maybe visions or artifacts that possess, uh, that possess remnants of their teachings, of their powers, and all of these things that they achieved in life. But it's only ever what they achieved in life which is extended beyond their lifetime. That's the sort of thing that, that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. We can achieve a sort of immortality, if you will, simply by affecting the world and having those changes sort of echo through history. But that's not at all the kind of personal immortality. The ability to continue to act as oneself, the ability to continue to be oneself, that the Sith strive for. The expense of all else, ironically, poetically, lightfully, it is that particular striving and acquisitiveness, the desire for, uh, for power to oneself at the expense of all else, that prevents them from achieving it. Well, that's all, the, uh, all I really have to say on this comparison. And I hope this was helpful, both as an explanation of Anselm uh, and also as an analysis uh, of a particularly interesting uh, aspect of Star Wars. Uh, so, I have for today. So, thank you for joining me. I hope this has uh, been a good video. See you next time.